On an afternoon in January of 2012, 56-year-old Jane Beshera and her husband Bob were standing in the front yard of their large five-bedroom, two-story home in Gross Point Park, a wealthy suburb of Detroit, Michigan. Jane was tall, with short, light brown hair, and she was wearing jeans, a sweater, and a black nylon jacket. The temperature was barely above 30 degrees Fahrenheit, but for people who had grown up in Michigan, like Jane and Bob, it didn't really feel that cold. And it wasn't snowing that day, so Jane thought it would be the perfect time to show Bob where she wanted to make some updates to the house and to the yard. So, the two of them walked around outside and talked about how they could make their home even more beautiful than it already was. Bob, or Big Bob, as he was known by most of their friends, was a huge, six foot four inch tall guy with broad shoulders and dark hair. And he made his living in real estate and property management, so he enjoyed figuring out ways to update houses and increase their worth, especially when it was his own personal home. Bob had grown up wealthy, but he'd always wanted to add to the money he'd inherited from his family. So he had started his own business. And now he collected rent on multiple properties in the area, including houses, apartments, and buildings with bars and restaurants inside of them. But it was Bob's height, not his money, that had first attracted Jane to him when they met at a party all the way back in 1983. Jane didn't think looks were the most important trait in a man, but she was tall and she liked tall guys. So when she had seen Bob towering over everybody else around him, he caught her eye. But once Jane and Bob had started talking that night at the party and spending time together afterwards, their attraction went far beyond physical appearance. They discovered they had a lot in common. Jane and Bob were both devoutly religious. Jane volunteered at her church, and Bob served as a deacon in his congregation. And once they had started dating, they enjoyed going to church services together. And they were also both really driven. Bob had worked very hard to start and grow his business, And even at a young age, Jane had made her way up the corporate ladder to land a high-paying marketing position. But the biggest thing that had drawn them together when they were young was that they had both wanted to start a family. And so after dating for about two years, Jane and Bob had gotten married. And not long after that, they had two kids, a son and then a daughter. And then Jane and Bob, along with their two kids, had moved into their dream home in Gross Point Park. But now both of their kids were out of the house. Their son had moved away for work, and their daughter had recently gone off to college. And so Jane and Bob were now adjusting to their new lives as empty nesters. And so they tried to find other things to focus on. They worked hard running charity fundraisers in the community, they spent more time with their friends, and they decided to do work on the house that they never had a chance to do when their kids were younger. As the couple walked around their property looking for things they wanted to fix, Bob said he knew someone who could get started very soon on some of these updates they wanted to make. Bob said the guy's name was Joseph Gentz and that he used him often as a handyman and yard guy at some of the properties that he managed. Jane said that would be great, but the truth was she had actually met Joseph when he'd done some small repairs around the house and she didn't really like him that much. Joseph was as big as Bob was, but not nearly as calm or soft-spoken. And Jane knew that Joseph had intellectual disabilities that sometimes made it difficult for him to communicate clearly. And when he got frustrated, Jane had seen that he would lash out, and it was kind of frightening. But Bob believed helping Joseph and making sure he had steady work and income was the right thing to do. And Jane couldn't argue with that because she believed people should do whatever they could to help those who were less fortunate than they were. So Jane smiled at Bob and said she was excited about the work they were going to get done on the house. Then she headed inside to get ready for a wine night she was hosting at the house for some of her friends. Later that night, Jane opened the front door for the first of her guests, and when she did, she looked out and she could see all the lights from the houses across the street, shining on the perfectly manicured lawns and luxury cars parked outside. And so even though her kids were no longer living there with them anymore, which made Jane feel a little bit sad, Jane still felt like Gross Point Park was the perfect place to live. But there was another side, a hidden side, to the Detroit suburbs that seemed like a completely different world from Jane and Bob's quiet neighborhood. And on a night in January, not long after Jane had her friends over, a person who was known online as, quote, Master, arrived at an event space that was part of that other hidden side of the suburbs. Master wrapped their arm around their partner's waist and then walked into a party filled with members of the local BDSM community. 
BDSM stands for bondage, domination, submission, and sadomasochism. And so the BDSM community was a group that practiced varying degrees of bondage, domination, submission, and sadomasochism, often in a sexual setting. Master was well known in the BDSM community because they hosted small gatherings of their own at a nearby dungeon, a two-room basement outfitted with a bed, whips, ropes, and other materials common to the BDSM scene. So, at the January party, Master and their partner made their way around the venue, said hello to the people they knew, and introduced themselves to people they hadn't met before. Loud music was playing and partygoers danced, drank, and talked. Some of the guests were dressed casually, almost like they'd come straight from work, but some were wearing head-to-toe leather, and others wore dog collars attached to leashes around their necks. And everybody, no matter what they were wearing, looked relaxed and like they were having a great time. Some people on the outside who were aware of the BDSM community thought this group was strange at best and dangerous at worst. But the truth was, most of the people at the party that night had healthy relationships, successful careers, and loving families. This was just one aspect of their lives that they had entered into happily and consensually. But Master was something different, and some members of the community, including some people at this party, wanted nothing to do with them. These people saw Master as someone who used the cover of BDSM to act out on their unchecked violent tendencies, and it would turn out those people were right. As Master walked through that party, they were totally preoccupied with violent thoughts. Because Master and their partner had big plans for the future, they wanted to invite a third person into their relationship who would live with them full-time in a brand new house they were going to buy. But Master knew doing something like that wasn't going to be easy. It would take work and a ton of money. And so Master had recently decided that to achieve their goals for the future, they would have to kill someone. And they had already chosen a target. It was a person who lived a relatively quiet life in a beautiful home in a wealthy suburb. At about 4.45 p.m. on January 24th, 2012, a couple of weeks after that BDSM party had taken place, Jane drove down the street through her neighborhood in her black Mercedes-Benz SUV. And as she drove, she was smiling and chatting on the phone with her daughter. Then Jane pulled into her driveway and hit the garage door opener. She told her daughter she would call her back in a little while once she'd gotten settled and changed out of her work clothes. Then she told her daughter she loved her, said goodbye, and hung up the phone. Jane pulled the Mercedes into the garage and then closed the garage door behind her and then glanced at the clock on the dashboard. She knew Bob wouldn't be home for a few hours because he was meeting a potential client for a drink, so she figured she'd relax for a little while, maybe have something to eat, and then call her daughter back. Then Jane turned off the engine, stepped out of her car, but right away she heard something behind her. Jane turned around and immediately froze. Someone was in the garage with her. Jane shouted at them, and the person lunged at her and shoved her against the car door. But Jane pushed back and stumbled forward. She was confused and terrified, and she thought she was being robbed. Then the person in the garage grabbed Jane from behind, raised up their fist, and slammed it into the back of Jane's head. Jane fell forward and hit the ground hard. Her head was pounding, but she tried to pull herself up. But before Jane could move, she felt a sharp pain in her neck and throat, and she struggled to breathe, and then everything went black. A few hours later, Bob pulled into the driveway and opened the garage door, and the garage was empty. Bob parked his car, went inside the house, and walked across the first floor to the living room. He sat down on the couch and turned on the TV. Then he gave his wife a call, but Jane didn't answer. So he left a message letting her know he was home and that he was just checking in to see where she was and when she would be home. And then Bob hung up and watched some more TV. But after a couple of hours went by with no word from Jane, Bob started to worry, so he called her again. But she still didn't answer. So Bob called a few of Jane's friends to see if she was with them or if maybe they had seen her, but they told him that no, she was not with them and they didn't know where she was. And so starting to panic, Bob started calling family members. And when he heard that Jane had told their daughter she was going to call her back but never did, Bob became very worried. So at around 11 p.m., six hours after Jane had pulled into her garage and been attacked by that stranger, Bob called 911 to report his wife was missing. But it had only been a few hours since someone had spoken to Jane, and Jane was an adult, 
so it was way too early to actually file a missing persons report. However, the officer told Bob that they would try to locate Jane to make sure everything was okay. And so Bob gave them Jane's description, along with Jane's phone number, and the make, model, and license plate number of Jane's car. But hours later, Bob still hadn't heard anything, so he called the police again. And they told him they still had not been able to find Jane, she wasn't picking up her phone, and they had not found her SUV. The police told Bob to stay calm, and they told him they would let him know if they learned anything new. But when Bob hung up, he couldn't calm down, and he ended up staying awake most of the night waiting to hear something. But by the time the sun rose on January 25th, Gross Point Park Police still had no idea where Jane Bashara was. On the morning of January 25th, about nine hours after Bob had first called the police, a tow truck driver was cruising the streets in an old neighborhood in East Detroit. Over the years, this neighborhood had become a popular spot in the city for drug dealers to do business, and it was seen as a hub for heroin users in Detroit. Because of that, a lot of the houses in this area had been abandoned, and people also often abandoned cars in this part of the city. And that's why the tow truck driver had made it a point to drive through the neighborhood every once in a while. So the driver scanned the streets from his truck, looking for cars he might be able to tow, but nothing really jumped out at him. But then he turned onto a side street and he drove past an alley. And when he did, he slammed on his brakes. He looked out his window into the alley and was shocked at what he saw. A beautiful black Mercedes-Benz SUV. The tow truck driver was used to finding cars stranded in the area, but he never saw cars that cost as much money as the one he was looking at. So the tow truck driver pulled his truck into the alley and parked close behind the SUV. Then he grabbed a pad of paper and a pen, and he wrote down the license plate number. Then the tow truck driver called his boss and told him about this car, he gave him the license plate number, and then he asked if he could go ahead and tow the vehicle. But the tow truck driver was shocked when his boss abruptly shouted at him to stay right where he was and not do anything. The tow truck driver asked what was going on, and his boss said the cops were looking for that car. So he just needed to stay there and not touch the car. The driver said he understood and hung up. And then, minutes later, the tow truck driver heard police sirens blaring through the neighborhood. And soon, his truck was blocked in the alley by multiple police cars. The tow truck driver tried to stay calm as a police officer with the Detroit Police Department approached the tow truck. The driver knew he had not done anything wrong, but he'd also never had police swarm around a car he was trying to tow. So the driver got out of his truck, he answered some basic questions from the cop, and said he'd been cruising around when he saw this car, and he made it clear that he had not done anything other than take down the license plate number and call it in to his boss. The police officer thanked the tow truck driver and then walked down the alley towards the Mercedes. Then the police officer leaned in close to the back window on the passenger side and he shielded his eyes with his hands to cut down on the glare. And when he got a clear view of the back seat of this car, he immediately yelled out for the other police officers to come over and take a look. And soon after, they got the car door open and stared at the back seat in disbelief. There on the back seat was a badly bruised and beaten dead body. But the body looked like it had been posed. The victim was on their knees with their face down on the seat, and a black nylon jacket had been put on the body backwards, so it looked like the victim was wearing a straitjacket. Once the officers got over the initial shock of what they had found, they proceeded to search the entire car. And during the search, they found an open purse lying on the front passenger seat floorboard. The contents of the purse had spilled out, and they quickly found a checkbook, credit cards, and a driver's license. The victim in the back seat was Jane Bishara. Not long after her discovery, homicide detective Donald Olson of the Detroit police parked his car near the alley and stepped outside. The cold weather, like most things, didn't really affect Olson. He had been a detective for a long time, and so he'd seen his share of horrible violence and strange cases all across Detroit. So, as he approached the officers who had first arrived on the scene, he didn't really expect to see or hear anything that would rattle him. But when Olson looked into the backseat of the Mercedes and saw Jane's body in that pose, he admitted he was shocked by it. And it wasn't just because of the pose Jane had been found in. 
Detective Olson just couldn't understand how a wealthy, middle-aged woman from Gross Point Park had ended up dead in a neighborhood in East Detroit that was known for drug deals and heroin use. Soon after Olson's arrival, the alley was blocked off with crime scene tape and filled with police. Olson's initial take was that Jane's death had not been a part of a robbery because her credit cards and checkbook were left behind in clear view inside of her car. But Olson wanted to wait for more information before he started forming any theories. And so, as forensics experts took blood samples and fingerprints from Jane's car and her body, Olson stepped away and called the Gross Point Park Police. And that police department was about as different from the Detroit police as possible. While Detroit cops had dealt with close to 400 reported homicide cases during the previous year, Gross Point Park hadn't had a single reported homicide in about a decade. So when Olson called to tell them that Detroit police had found a murder victim who was a Gross Point Park resident, the officer on the other line was stunned. Then Olson said they needed to inform the victim's husband, Bob Beshera and Olson said he would drive out to Gross Point Park to accompany the officer delivering the news to Bob's house. Olson knew the small suburban police department would not have dealt with a case like this before, so he wanted to be there when Jane's husband was given the news. Because Olson knew the first place to start with a homicide like this was almost always with the spouse, even if it was just to rule them out. So Olson got in his car and drove from the neighborhood in East Detroit where Jane had been found to Gross Point Park. The drive only took him about 20 minutes, but as Olsen looked out at the huge homes and the fancy cars lining the streets, he felt like he might as well have traveled to a different planet. At around 10.45 a.m., almost two hours after Jane's body had been discovered, Detective Olsen and an officer from the Gross Point Park Police walked up to Bob and Jane's front door. But before they could even ring the bell, the door swung open and Bob stepped outside. His hair was a mess and his eyes were bloodshot, and the first thing he said to them was he had been waiting all night to hear anything from the police, so what's going on? But then Bob noticed the looks on Olsen and the other officer's face, and immediately he just dropped his head and slumped over. Olsen gently asked if they could come inside to talk, and Bob nodded. Then Bob turned around and slowly led them through the entryway into the dining room, where they all sat down at a long dining room table. Then Olson looked at Bob and in a quiet voice said Detroit police had located his wife's car and they had found her body inside. And even though Bob was obviously shaken up, his reaction to this was to immediately start recounting all the events of the previous day, telling Detective Olson where his wife had been and where he had been. Olson thought this was a strange, somewhat defensive reaction, but he knew from experience people reacted very strangely to horrible news like this. And when Bob finally slowed down and stopped talking, Olson just said he was very sorry for his loss and that he did not want to impose right now. But he asked if Bob would be willing to stop by the Gross Point Park Police Department the following day to answer some questions. Bob said he would definitely do that and that he was willing to do anything they wanted to help them figure out what happened to his wife. Olson and the other officer told Bob again how sorry they were, and they thanked him for taking a few minutes to talk to them, and then the officers walked out of the house and headed for their car. And once the police were gone, Bob was forced to call his kids and his family to tell them the horrible news. And as Bob made these very difficult calls, word began to spread through Gross Point Park that Jane had been found dead in the backseat of her car in East Detroit, and it sent the town into a sort of shock. People couldn't believe that this had happened to someone who had been so well-liked in such a vital part of their community. And a lot of people who heard the news and who talked to Bob made it clear they wanted to come together right away to do something to honor Jane. And so that evening, Bob stepped out of his house and took part in a huge candlelight vigil right in his front yard to honor his wife. And that night, scenes from this candlelight vigil made it onto the news, and Detective Olson realized by seeing the images just how much of an impact Jane's death had had on her entire community. And so he hoped he would be able to bring the case to a quick close so they could all start to heal. On the same night as this candlelight vigil, so January 25th, which was the same day that Jane was found in East Detroit, the person known online as Master grabbed their phone and called their partner. Master told their partner to come over to their house so they could discuss the big plans they had been making for the future, 
bringing a third person into their relationship, and buying a new home together. But their partner seemed upset and distant, and for a minute, Master started to worry. They were sure they had never mentioned their thoughts about killing someone to their partner, but now they wondered if somehow they had slipped up, and if their partner suspected that they had something to do with the murder that was now all over the news. And so Master asked their partner one more time to come by the house, but their partner flatly refused and hung up the phone not long after. And so Master just sat there in silence for a moment, trying not to panic, because all that was going through their mind was, if my own partner thinks I might have killed someone, isn't it just a matter of time before the police think the same thing? The following morning, so on January 26th, one day after Jane's body had been discovered, Bob followed an officer through the Gross Point Park Police Station to a small interrogation room. Bob walked across the brightly lit room with stark white walls, greeted Detective Olson and the other officer he'd seen at his house the day before, and then took a seat at a small table that was pressed up against the wall. Olson sat down next to Bob and thanked him for coming in. Then Olson asked Bob if he had been able to think of anything that might help them or if he knew of anyone who might have had a grudge against Jane. But Bob said he couldn't think of anything because none of this made any sense to him. He said Jane was well-loved in town, at her job, at their church, and as far as he knew, she had never even driven to that part of Detroit where she was found. And so Bob just kept saying over and over again that really none of this made any sense. Olson said he understood, but then he leaned across the small table and looked Bob dead in the eye. And then Olson said he knew every marriage had its problems and that husbands and wives often kept secrets from each other. And Olson said he wondered if maybe there was something going on in Jane's life that Bob might not have known about. But Bob just started to look confused, and he told Olson that he and his wife had been together long enough that they basically told each other everything that was on their minds. And if there was something he didn't know about her, it would have been something really little that had no bearing on anything. But then Bob stopped himself mid-sentence, and he started shaking his head. So Olson leaned in even closer and asked Bob if he just remembered something. Bob looked up at Olson and then looked back down at the floor. Then he said he didn't want to talk badly about his wife, especially now that she was gone. But Olson said if he had information that could help the investigation, he needed to tell them. And so Bob nodded, took a breath, and looked back up at Olson. Then he said Jane did have a secret that she didn't keep from him, but that she did keep from almost everybody else. He said Jane smoked marijuana. At the time, marijuana was illegal in Michigan, so Bob knew Jane would have to meet with a dealer to get her supply. But Bob said he never pressed Jane about where she went or who she got her drugs from. Detective Olson immediately thought to himself there had to be a bunch of different places a wealthy suburban woman could score some weed from before she ever had to go to East Detroit to get it, but he didn't want to rule anything out. And for all he knew, maybe Jane did have other secrets she was hiding from her husband or from other people around her. So, after asking Bob a few more follow-up questions, Detective Olson thanked Bob for coming in to talk to them again, and then he also asked if Bob would be willing to submit to a DNA test. And Bob said, of course. And so, while another officer prepped Bob for his DNA test, Olson headed out of the police station in Gross Point Park and made his way back to Detroit. And now he planned to look into the possibility that Jane had been in East Detroit buying drugs. But before Olson could pursue this new potential lead, he got some news that would change the entire investigation. Based on evidence found in and around Jane's car, along with cell phone tracking data, the forensics team came to believe that Jane had not been killed in East Detroit. Instead, they thought the murder had taken place in Gross Point Park, and then Jane's car and body had been driven to East Detroit and then abandoned there. And so that theory led a forensics team to do a sweep of Bob and Jane's garage, and that forensics team discovered blood spatter on the ground, and that blood turned out to be Jane's. And so all of a sudden, this was no longer a Detroit homicide case. And while Detective Olson and Detroit police would still be on hand to assist, the bulk of the investigation would now come down to the small Gross Point Park Police Department. At about 4.30 a.m. on January 31st, six days after Jane's body had been discovered, an officer was working the late shift at the front desk in the Gross Point Park Police Station. The investigation into Jane's murder had been in full swing for days, but things had been relatively quiet while investigators waited on more test results from Bob and Jane's garage. 
Then suddenly, the officer at the front desk heard the station door open. He looked up and he saw this huge, hulking man walking towards him, acting kind of erratic. The man wore a suit and he kept pulling at the jacket sleeves as he walked. Then the man stepped right up to the officer, said his name was Joseph Gentz, and that he was the man who killed Jane Bashara. At first, the officer just stared at Joseph. There were no detectives at the station that early in the morning, and he really didn't know how to handle something like this. But he pulled himself together and asked Joseph to give him his full name again. Joseph told him who he was and that he had worked as a handyman for Jane's husband, Bob. The officer still wasn't sure exactly what to do, so he led Joseph to one of the few holding cells they had at the station, he locked Joseph inside of it, and then he went back to the front desk and made some calls. And that morning, Detective Mike Narduzzi of the Gross Point Park Police woke up to the sound of his phone ringing. And at first, he couldn't understand what he was hearing. So he asked the officer on the other line to slow down and tell him clearly what was going on. And when Narduzzi heard there was a man at the station confessing to Jane's murder, he shook himself awake and got dressed as fast as he could. Narduzzi had taken over the case when it moved out of Detroit, and he was already feeling totally overwhelmed. He'd only been a detective for about three years, and he had never handled a homicide. But as he sped down the road in his car towards the station, he told himself that a confession could be everything he had hoped for, and it could allow him and his team to close this case way faster than they expected. A few minutes later, Narduzzi arrived at the station, and he headed right to the interrogation room where Bob had been questioned a few days earlier. He walked into the room, and he saw Joseph already sitting at the small table. And Narduzzi stopped and just stared for a second. Even sitting down, Joseph looked enormous. But Narduzzi put on a smile, introduced himself to Joseph, and then sat down at the table with him. Then Narduzzi asked Joseph to explain what he knew about Jane's murder. And Joseph told Narduzzi that he had done a bunch of work for Bob at his different properties, and so that's how he knew the Basharas. And then Joseph started explaining how he had killed Jane step by step. But then suddenly, Joseph stood up and started unbuttoning his dress shirt. Narduzzi asked him to sit down, but Joseph lifted up his shirt and showed scratches on his chest and stomach, and he said that was where Jane had fought back. Then Joseph started pacing around the small room and saying something about money, and Narduzzi kept trying to get Joseph to sit down and stay calm because he couldn't figure out exactly what Joseph was even talking about. Finally, Joseph stopped pacing, and he leaned down, looked at Narduzzi, and said there was way more to this story, and that there was actually a conspiracy behind Jane's murder. But when Narduzzi asked for more clarification, Joseph just couldn't really explain what he was saying. And by the end of this meeting, Detective Narduzzi was exhausted and confused. It was clear to him that Joseph had some intellectual disabilities, and that it was difficult for him to tell a clear story. But Narduzzi wondered if Joseph really was just having trouble explaining it, or if maybe he was making this up. And so, the Gross Point Park Police ended up holding Joseph in a cell overnight, and then they questioned him again the following day. And this time, Joseph was clearer about what had taken place on the day of Jane's murder. But by the end of that session, Narduzzi still had a lot of questions. And so he didn't think they had enough proof to charge Joseph with Jane's murder, but he did think they could get that proof down the line if they could follow up on some of the things Joseph had been talking about. So Joseph was released from police custody and told not to leave town, and the investigative team went to work trying to corroborate Joseph's story. And in early March, a little over a month after Joseph's confession, police arrested him and charged him with murder. The news of Joseph's arrest spread quickly, and it at least provided some comfort to Jane's family and friends. And the Gross Point Park community was happy that justice had been served and that their town felt safe again. But in reality, this case wasn't actually closed, and it would prove to be way more bizarre than anyone had realized. Because in the months following Joseph's confession, the Gross Point Park police would receive two phone calls that would send investigators back into the field. And what they learned from those calls would eventually lead them to the BDSM community and into the world of the person who called themselves Master. Based on the phone calls police received following Joseph's confession, evidence found in Jane's car and in her garage, cell phone data, and interviews conducted throughout the investigation, here is a reconstruction of what authorities believe happened to Jane Bashara on the day she was killed, January 24th, 2012. 
At 4.45 p.m., Jane's killer crouched in the corner of Jane's dark garage. They wore black pants, a black leather motorcycle jacket, and thick-soled black boots. The killer had gone over their plan, but they were still nervous, and they could feel their hands shaking. Then suddenly, the garage door began to open, and the overhead light went on, and the killer immediately pulled themselves as close to the wall as possible so they wouldn't be seen. Then, the killer watched as Jane's Mercedes SUV pulled into the garage, and they could see Jane talking on the phone in her car. The killer took a deep breath and waited. Jane hung up the phone, turned off the engine, grabbed her purse from the passenger seat, and stepped out of the car. But the killer didn't move, because they weren't sure if they could go through with this. But then, Jane turned around, and she saw the killer and started shouting, and the killer panicked. So the killer stood up to their full huge height, they lunged out of the corner, grabbed Jane, and shoved her into the driver's side door. But Jane scratched as hard as she could at the killer's chest and managed to step away from the car, but then the killer grabbed her from behind and slammed their fist into the back of her head. Jane's purse dropped from her hand and she fell to the ground face first, and then she began pleading for help and trying to pull herself to safety but the killer immediately dropped down to the ground right on top of Jane's back, and they wrapped their huge hands around her throat. Jane choked and struggled to breathe, and her feet started kicking wildly, and the killer could hear her shouting. Finally, the killer released their grip, and Jane's head hit the ground, and she lay there wheezing, trying to compose herself. Then the killer stood back up, raised their boot, and placed it on the back of Jane's neck, and stomped. The killer heard a loud crack, and then afterward, they slowly backed away from Jane's now dead body. The killer wanted to run, but then they heard a voice from the other corner of the garage, and the person who called themselves Master stepped into the light. And together, Master and the killer picked up Jane's body and put her in the backseat of the car on her knees. Then, Master took off Jane's jacket and put it on her backwards, so she looked like she was bound in a straitjacket. Master grabbed Jane's purse and dumped out the contents on the passenger floorboard. Then, they told the killer to drive to East Detroit and leave Jane's car there with her body inside. The killer nodded, got into the car, backed out of the garage, and sped off. And when the Mercedes was out of sight, Master, a.k.a. Bob Beshera, Jane's husband, closed the garage door. Then, Bob went into the house, changed his clothes, and headed out to drink at a bar that was housed in one of the properties he owned. It would turn out Joseph Gentz, Bob's handyman, really was Jane's killer. But Joseph had been working for Bob the whole time. The revelation of Bob's involvement in the murder would take police months to unravel, because this case led them down paths they just hadn't seen coming. And with each new piece of evidence, the case just seemed to get even stranger. Bob, aka Master, who was well known in the BDSM scene, had been planning to buy a new house for him and his partner, a woman he'd been having an affair with for years. And they were both eager to welcome a third person into their relationship who would live with them in this new house. But in order to make that happen, Bob would have to get rid of his wife, Jane. And he couldn't just divorce her, because it turned out that Bob's personal wealth had taken a huge hit over the past few years, and his real estate business was failing. But if Jane was dead, Bob could collect money from her life insurance policy and her substantial 401k retirement fund, and he could drain their joint bank accounts and sell their house. And all that money would enable him to support himself and the two women he hoped to start a new life with. Joseph Gentz had brought up Bob's involvement in Jane's murder during his confession, and he had said Bob had paid him to kill Jane. But Joseph changed his story about Bob's role in the murder multiple times, so police didn't feel like they had enough evidence to initially charge Bob. But then, the woman Bob had been having an affair with reached out to police, because it turned out Bob had lied to her for years and said he and Jane were divorced, and it wasn't until she saw clips of the candlelight vigil on the news that she realized Bob had still been married, and she started to suspect that he had murdered Jane. And so she pulled away from Bob and told police they had been having an affair for years and that they were planning on buying this house together soon, but she didn't say anything to police about her and Bob's involvement in the BDSM community. But soon after that, police received the two phone calls that cracked the case wide open. The first was from a woman in Oregon who said Bob had found her on a BDSM site, 
and Bob had wanted her to be the woman to join him and his girlfriend as the third live-in member of their relationship. But when this woman had refused to move to Michigan and said she didn't want anything to do with Bob, he started to harass and stalk her online. And so when she read about Jane's murder and saw who Jane's husband was, she called the Gross Point Park Police to say Bob was potentially dangerous and could very easily have killed his wife. This led police to finding more information about Bob's life in the BDSM community, and they found others in that community who also believed Bob was capable of real violence. And then, as police started to close in on Bob, they got the second of the two important phone calls. This call was from a local furniture salesman who knew Bob, and this man said Bob had contacted him and offered him thousands of dollars to kill Joseph Gentz before Joseph could testify against Bob in court. And soon after they got that call, investigators convinced the furniture salesman to wear a wire so they could get proof of Bob offering to pay money for a hit on Joseph. The furniture salesman agreed, and Bob immediately fell into the trap, being caught on tape offering money to have Joseph murdered. And so, in late June of 2012, five months after Jane's murder, police finally had enough evidence to arrest and charge Bob for killing his wife. Joseph Gentz, the killer, was convicted of second-degree murder and sentenced to 17 to 28 years in prison with the possibility of parole in 2029. Bob Beshera was convicted of murder as well and sentenced to life in prison. He died behind bars in 2020 at the age of 62. In the late 1860s, a group of rugged American explorers came out of the wilderness and went straight to a newspaper to tell them about this otherworldly place they had found. And so the newspaper sat down, they got their notepad out, and these explorers start describing this place. And they say, okay, well, it's this huge expanse of wilderness. And in the middle of it, there are all these boiling lakes that are either neon green or yellow or red or all of those. And they're shooting boiling water into the sky. And there are these breathtaking waterfalls and snow-capped mountains. And there are bison and elk and wolves and bears just free roaming the whole area. And so the newspaper, they take all this down. And at the end of it, they say, okay, guys, well, unfortunately, we don't publish fiction. But these explorers weren't lying. They were describing an area that we now know as Yellowstone National Park, which is this massive expanse of wilderness in Wyoming that sits on top of a volcano. And those boiling neon green, red, and yellow lakes really do exist. Those are hot springs, and they are the result of water passing by and making contact with underground magma chambers. Today, Yellowstone is so popular that every year, millions of people go to the park. And so as a result, the park employs hundreds of people year-round to keep up with tourism. Many of these employees are young people, like college students. And in addition to being paid for their work, the park also offers them the ability to live in employee housing, which are basically dormitories spaced all across the park to make it easier to just be on site and do their job. And these dormitories are either free or very low cost. And so these young people typically take up that offer and will stay inside of these dormitories for as long as they're working at the park. And so in 2000, a 20-year-old summer employee named Sarah Hulfers, she was staying in one of these dormitories in the park and she was in her room when a group of other young employees that were staying in this dorm came down the hall and they knocked on her door and they asked her if she wanted to come with them to go swimming. And so Sarah, she had a day off and she wasn't doing anything. And so she said, sure, I'll come with you guys. And so after they all got their bathing suits on and got their towels and snacks packed, they left the dormitories and got into a couple of cars. And then they drove over to this dirt lot that was right up against this huge forest. And so they parked, they got out and they make their way over to this trailhead that begins in the parking lot and goes straight into this forest. And so they walk down this trail until the trail goes right out of the forest and brings them to the edge of this river. And this river was called the Firehole River. It was called that because the surface of this river steamed and it gave the impression that this river was on fire. The reason this happened is some of the water flowing through this river would pass by those underground magma chambers, warming it up. And so this is a lot like the hot springs, except on a much smaller level. The hot springs are boiling, whereas this river was just slightly warmer to the point where it would steam. So totally safe to swim in. 
So Sarah and the rest of this group, they come out of that trailhead and they're standing on the edge of this beautiful river and they walk down to the edge and they all jump in and they have this great day. They're swimming around, they're playing games and they were only expecting to be there for a couple of hours, but they were having so much fun that before long, the sun had gone down and they were still in the river. And so when it was dark out, they finally climbed out of the river and they toweled off and then they realized they had a bit of a problem. Because they did not expect to be there for as long as they were, no one had brought flashlights, and the way back to the parking lot would be going along that trail through the forest, but that was a pretty far trail, and it's totally pitch black out. There's no ambient light, and realistically, there's some pretty big animals that live inside of that forest, and so some people in this group were a little bit nervous about walking through this forest. But ultimately, about half of the group said, you know what, whatever, let's just run through the forest and get back to our cars as fast as we can. I'm sure nothing will happen to us. And the other half decided they would look for an alternative route that would skirt the forest and allow the moonlight to be their guide along the way. That second group was made up of Sarah, along with two 18-year-old boys named Lance Bucci and Tyler Montague. So Sarah and these two boys, they're standing there and they're watching the first group go into the forest and disappear. And then she, along with these two guys, they turn right and they begin skirting the river and walking around the forest. And so they walk downstream with the river on one side and the forest on their left. And they're walking for a while until they see up ahead on their left, it looks like the forest is starting to thin out maybe a little bit. And so they took that as an opportunity to cut left and basically begin kind of going straight towards the parking lot, which was generally off to their left. And so they make that turn, they start walking, and the terrain is relatively open. It's this big open field with a couple of trees here and there. It was pretty easy to navigate, and they felt like, hey, we found a great alternative route. The moonlight's still shining through, we got great visibility. And so they're walking along, happy as can be, and then they see there's a couple of streams up ahead. They get to the first stream, and it's not that big, so they jump across it. They get to the next stream, it's still not that big, they jump across that one. And then they get to this third stream and they realize, you know, it's still pretty small, but it's significantly bigger than the last two. And so if we mistime it, we could fall into it. Now, this was not some huge deal. They were already wet from having gone swimming, but they didn't want to jump in this stream. And so they considered walking off to the right and trying to find an area that was more narrow. They could jump across more easily, but they figured they were probably within maybe one or 200 feet of the parking lot. They couldn't see it, but they knew they were close, and they really didn't want to go farther and farther away to only have to just jump over this thing anyways. And so they decide, you know what, let's just jump across it. Let's just do it. If we fall in, we fall in. And so the three of them backed up from the stream to give themselves some running room, and then they grabbed hands, and at the same time, all three of them ran forward and leapt across the stream, and they cleared it. They landed on the other side, but the ground they landed on was kind of loose and soft, and so it kind of crumbled underneath them, and they all fell backwards into the stream. In the darkness, this stream had looked like the other two streams they had seen, albeit a little bit larger, and so they were not thinking this could be potentially hazardous if they fell into the water. But it would turn out this stream was extremely hazardous. It was nothing like the other two streams they had encountered. This one was runoff from a nearby hot spring. And so the temperature inside of this stream was 178 degrees Fahrenheit. So it was practically boiling water and it looked like it was shallow. But in fact, this stream was 10 feet deep. And so when this trio fell into these scalding waters, they let out blood-curdling streams, and the other group that had ran down the forest path, they had got to the parking lot and were waiting for them, and so they hear this scream, and they just take off running in the direction of the screams. They cut right through the forest, and they come out to that field, and they find Lance and Tyler are on the edge of the stream, desperately trying to pull Sarah out of the water. And so the parking lot crew, they run over and they grab Sarah, they pull her out. They don't really know what's happened. They don't know this is some boiling stream, but it very quickly dawns on them when Lance and Tyler and Sarah just continue to scream outside of the water that something is horribly wrong. And so one of the people in the parking lot crew, they take off running, they go into one of their cars and they drive and they get help. And not that long after, a helicopter would arrive and it would take Sarah, Lance and Tyler to a nearby hospital. It would turn out Lance and Tyler, when they fell into this water, they only submerged up to their necks. And as soon as they hit the water, they immediately turned and got themselves out again. So they were only in the water for maybe a second or two. 
and these things ultimately saved their lives. Although they did still have burns over almost their entire bodies, they had to go through dozens and dozens of surgeries and years of rehab, and they had to pay all this money for medical bills. So it was not a smooth course after they got pulled out, but they lived. As for Sarah, she was not as lucky. When she fell into the water, she completely submerged. Her head, her body, all of it went under the water, and then she just could not get herself out again, and so she stayed in the water much longer than the guys did. When she was admitted to the hospital, despite the fact she was talking and conscious, the doctors very quickly realized they had a big problem with her. A third degree burn or a full thickness burn is when the outer layer of skin gets destroyed and also the inner deeper tissues of the skin also gets destroyed, including the cells that are responsible for reproducing skin. And so if you get a third degree burn, that part of your body will not heal on its own. You literally have to get a skin graft and a skin graft is effectively a skin transplant. They will take other sections of skin from your body that are unburned and they will place them over that site where you have the third degree burn. But when Sarah was wheeled into the operating room, it was determined that she had third degree burns on 100% of her body. So there was no unburned skin to use for a skin graft. Her whole body was ruined. And so despite their best efforts, Sarah would pass away 15 hours after arriving at the hospital. A year later, Lance's family would sue the National Park Service for not having put up a sign near that particular stream to warn people of its dangers. But that lawsuit was tossed out because it was determined that the trio, Sarah, Tyler, and Lance, had chosen to walk off trail in a known thermal area, and so they were being negligent, not the park. The next story, which is our number two story on today's list, is called Magellan. If you hop in a boat just off the coast of Aberdeen, Scotland, and you cruise eastward, after about seven hours, depending on your speed and the weather, you would come across this massive man-made structure jutting up out of the ocean. It looks like a cross between a construction site and a corporate office building sitting on top of 100-foot-tall metal stilts. It's called Magellan, and it is an offshore oil rig, and it will remain in place until all the oil has been sucked up in that area. The people who work, often for weeks or months at a time, on rigs like Magellan, are known as roughnecks, and they have one of, if not the most, dangerous job in the world. All exterior surfaces on these offshore rigs are always slick, either with water or oil, and so there is a constant risk of falling, sometimes hundreds of feet. If you're up on a higher platform, you could fall to a lower platform, which could be fatal, or you could fall clean off the rig all the way to the ocean 100 plus feet below. If you add in some bad windy weather, the risk of falling increases tenfold. Also, the crude oil that these roughnecks are drilling for is highly combustible, and so fires are a huge concern as well. And if that wasn't risky enough, there's also this phenomenon known as a blowout, where basically the oil well that the drill is actually drilling into will just explode. Now, all rigs have some sort of mitigating equipment to try to save themselves in case this occurs, but in reality, if it happens and you are unfortunately near the drill when it happens, you are likely to be killed or maimed. While the downsides of working on an oil rig are fairly obvious, the upsides are too. Namely, your pay is fantastic. In 2000, a 41-year-old father of two named Gordon Moffat was a roughneck working on the Magellan. His primary job was to perform maintenance on the drill. Now, these offshore rigs work great most of the time, but they do have a habit of breaking down fairly often. And for a drilling company, any time they are not sucking out crude oil, they're losing money. And so it was just a known thing when you worked on one of these rigs that as soon as there is an issue that causes the drill to stop working, it must be fixed immediately, whether it's day, night, Horrible weather, good weather, it didn't matter, it had to be fixed right away. And so on the night of October 9th that year, Gordon had just gotten back to his quarters to end the day when he got a call on his radio that he was actually needed to come back out to fix a problem that had stopped the drill. 
Now, Gordon was a seasoned roughneck, and he had grown quite accustomed to these late-night calls to go out and fix things, and so he wasn't annoyed. He just put his stuff back on, turned around, and he headed out the door. When Gordon got to the main deck, which is this wide open metal platform right in the middle of the rig where the drill actually passes down through it on its way to the ocean, when he got to the main deck, he was met by some of his co-workers who told him where he would need to go. The cabling that needed fixing was located right below the main deck. However, it was not accessible from the main deck. In order for Gordon to get to it, he would need to go down to the next lowest platform from the main deck. Basically, he would need to hop in an elevator and go down one floor. And from this lower deck, the crew on the main deck would lower down a harness attached to a long wire. They would feed it down through this hole in the main deck platform called a mouse hole. It was about 10 inches across. And they would feed it down and he would grab the harness, he would put it on, and then he would signal up to the main deck crew who could literally see him through this mouse hole, they would turn around and they would signal somebody called the hoist operator. And they were located above the main deck, slightly back. They couldn't actually see Gordon. So they're relying on communications with the people on the main deck. And the hoist operator would start their winch. And a winch basically reels in the wire that was connected to the harness that was on Gordon. And so once the hoist operator was informed, he'd turn on the winch, and then Gordon would be raised up until he could access these cables, and then he'd do his maintenance and be lowered back down, and that would be it. Now, Gordon and the crew had done maintenance using this winch system many times before, so this was a very routine fix. So Gordon made his way from the main deck down to the slightly lower deck, and he looked up at the mouse hole, and he watched as the main deck crew members lowered the harness with the wire attached to it down through the mouse hole, and so Gordon grabbed the harness, he put it around his waist, and he secured it, and after he was sure it was on correctly, he signaled up to the crew on the main deck that he was ready to start, and they in turn turned around, they flagged the hoist operator who started the winch. And so very slowly, Gordon was lifted off the platform he was standing on, and he was brought up after several minutes, all the way up about 10 feet to access these cables. And as soon as he was parallel with them, he waved to the main deck crew, who were not far from him at this point, and he said, I'm good. And so they turned around, they told the hoist operator, who stopped the winch. And so Gordon got his tools out and he began working on these cables and the whole time he's trying to stay in one place because the wind is whipping through and he's kind of dangling and swinging around. And then eventually he finishes the repair, the cables are good, and so he signals the crew on the main deck through the mouse hole that he was good to go, you can lower me back down now. And so the main deck crew, they turn, they wave to the hoist operator to go ahead and lower Gordon, and the hoist operator, he gives a thumbs up and he starts the winch. However, the hoist operator accidentally forgot to switch the direction of the winch. And so when he started it again, instead of the winch spooling the wire out and lowering Gordon, it continued to reel the wire in, pulling Gordon upward. Now, the winch did not move very quickly, and so it wasn't like Gordon is rocketing up towards the mouse hole. However, this problem was immediately recognized by Gordon and the main deck crew, and so they're frustrated, they're yelling up at the hoist operator saying, stop, 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 reverse the winch, they're all waving and flagging this guy down. But the hoist operator, after he had hit start on the winch, had just kind of turned around, because this is a routine thing they'd done a million times before, and so he's not looking at the crew on the main deck, so he has no idea what's going on, and it was so windy and loud that night on board the rig that he couldn't hear their cries. And so the winch just continued to reel in the wire, slowly raising Gordon closer and closer to the mouse hole. Now, Gordon could not get out of his harness unless he was on the platform below. So there was no way to escape the situation he was in. And so Gordon, after a few seconds of this not stopping and him continuing upward, he starts screaming. He's not annoyed anymore. He's terrified. And so is the crew on the main deck. They are now frantically screaming at the hoist operator to stop the winch, but nothing is working. And so one of the main deck crew members sensing that they need to do something different to get this guy's attention, he runs away from where the mouse hole is to this nearby phone. And this phone is connected up to the hoist operator station and he picks it up and it starts dialing. Up in the hoist operator station, he's still not paying attention when the phone rings. He grabs the phone, puts it to his ear, and immediately he's hit with screams to stop the winch. And so the hoist operator, totally confused, whips around and hits stop on the winch. But it was too late. Just a few moments earlier, 
Gordon had finally been pulled all the way up right to the entrance of the underside of this mouse hole. And as he reached this hole, he tried to position himself in a vertical position so that maybe he could slip his upper body into the hole and he could just kind of slide through the hole. He'd still be hurt by it, but it would limit the damage. However, because of his harness being on his waist right in front of him, he couldn't get himself into a vertical position. He could only lay back in a horizontal one. And so when he reached the underside of the main deck and he's looking right at this mouse hole, he just put his arms and his legs out and tried to push himself back as if he could fight the winch and keep himself from going into this hole. But there was nothing he could do. And so his pelvis first was pulled into the 10 inch hole. And as his body begins to literally break in half, he's screaming out in pain. And then by the time the hoist operator had hit stop, Gordon was already deceased and only a section of his torso actually made it up through the hole. Gordon's company was found guilty of being blatantly delinquent on many safety protocols, and so they were fined 60,000 pounds, and then they paid an undisclosed amount to Gordon's family. The next and final story, which is the top story of today's list, is called Boilermakers. At 7.20 p.m. on Friday, January 12, 2007, 19-year-old college freshman Wade Steffi walked into Ford Dining Hall, which is one of five dining halls on Purdue University's campus. Purdue is a prestigious American university located in Indiana that is known for its excellent athletics and academics. Wade, who was an aviation technology student and was at Purdue on a full academic scholarship, grabbed some food and then sat down at a table with some friends. This was the first Friday of the 2007 spring semester, and so Wade and his friends at the table and the hundreds of other students that were sitting all around them were buzzing with excitement about what they were up to that night and what they were up to that weekend. And so Wade and his friends, they sat there chatting about their plans for about an hour. And then at around 8.20 p.m., Wade realized he needed to leave. And so he stood up, he said goodbye to his friends, he carried his tray to the trash can, and then he made his way out of the doors he came in on. And so once he was outside of the dining hall, he immediately turned right and walked the very short distance to the building that was right next to Ford Dining Hall. And so that building was called Owen Hall, and it was a dormitory. Now, this was not Wade's dormitory. He actually lived in a different dorm called Cary Quad West, which was located on the other side of Ford Dining Hall. And so Wade goes inside of Owen Hall because he has some friends in there, and he makes his way to their room, and when he goes inside, he sees they're all kind of sitting around chatting and drinking some alcoholic drinks. And so Wade sits down, and he has a couple of drinks, and he just hangs out with his friends for about an hour. And so around 9.30 p.m., Wade and the other people he was with in this room, they left Owen Hall and they walked the half mile away from campus to the west to this huge party at a fraternity. And so Wade would stay at this fraternity for several hours until about midnight, at which point he pulled one of his friends aside and he told them that he just remembered he had left his jacket inside of Owen Hall and so he wanted to go back and retrieve it. The dorms on Purdue's campus all lock at night, and so the only way you can get inside is if you live there and so you have a key, or if you know someone who lives there who will open the door for you. And so during his walk back to Owen Hall, Wade would make six phone calls in an attempt to get someone in Owen Hall to open the door for him. But four of his phone calls would just be the wrong number, and so the people that were picking up and he was asking to open the door they didn't know what he was talking about, and so they hung up. But he did call two people that did live inside of Owen Hall. However, they didn't answer their phones. And so around 12.30 a.m., Wade arrived at Owen Hall. He put his phone back in his pocket, and he just walked up to the doors, which were locked, and he just started knocking. And eventually, a resident of Owen Hall who didn't know Wade, and Wade didn't know them, they heard the knocking, and they came out to the door to see what was going on and they looked through the glass and they saw Wade and apparently they decided that Wade looked too intoxicated to let into the building and so they refused him entry. And so Wade apparently stood there, he kept knocking for a little bit, but he eventually just kind of gave up, he turned around and he walked away. 
Fast forward a few days to Tuesday, January 16th, and Wade's roommate, who had actually been gone all the past weekend, he returned, and the first thing he noticed when he got back to his dorm was that Wade was not in the dorm. And so he called and texted Wade, but he didn't get a response. And so the roommate went out around the floor that they lived on to ask people if they had seen Wade, and no one had seen him since the previous Friday. And so starting to get pretty concerned, the roommate called Wade's family to see if maybe they knew what was going on with him, but his family had no idea. And so by the end of that day, the police had been contacted about Wade potentially being missing, and they in turn contacted Wade's cell phone provider, and they were able to determine that Wade's cell phone was still showing up somewhere on Purdue's campus, although they couldn't figure out exactly where. So that evening, a massive campus-wide search was launched with hundreds of police officers and volunteers. Even the school's equestrian club came out with their horses to search the nearby woods. But despite this huge search effort that would go on for several weeks, the only thing they would find of Wade's was one of his shoes. It was found on January 20th, so just four days into the search, and it was located right outside of an exterior door that led into a maintenance room inside of Owen Hall. But when they searched this maintenance room, Wade wasn't in there. Finally, after nearly a month of searching, when they still had not found Wade, the official search was called off. On March 19th, roughly two months after Wade had been reported missing, a maintenance worker was downstairs in the laundry room of Owen Hall when they heard a strange popping sound. At first, the worker thought it was actually coming from one of the washers or dryers that was on, and you know, maybe there's a loose coin or some piece of metal that was inside of the washer or dryer that's getting banged around inside and that's making the sound. And so this worker began walking around the laundry room, kind of listening in to each of the washers and dryers that were on to see if they were making this sound. And so as he's doing this, he hears the popping sound again, but it's clearly not coming from any of the washers and dryers. In fact, it's not even coming from inside the laundry room. It's coming from somewhere out in the hall. Curious, he leaves the laundry room and he goes out into the hall, and as soon as he's standing in the hall, he hears the popping sound again. And this time, it was obvious that it was coming from behind the closed door that was directly opposite the laundry room. So the worker pulled out his big set of keys, he opened the door that was directly in front of him, and he stepped inside. Moments later, he would make a big discovery. Based on that discovery and the investigation that would follow it, this is a reconstruction of what happened to Wade Steffi. In the early morning hours of January 13th, right after Wade had been denied entry into Owen Hall, because the student who was in there who didn't know him thought he was too intoxicated. Right after that happened, Wade left the front doors and made his way around to the left side of the building to look for another way inside. And when he got to the left side of the building, he found another door. Now, even though this door did not have a sign on it that said, keep out, it was fairly obvious that this door was not designed for students to use. There was a metal railing that lined the outside of the store, clearly to prevent pedestrians from getting to the door, and the door itself was actually not built at ground level. It basically was built at basement level, so you'd be standing at this railing looking down at the door, and down in front of the door was a slab of cement right out in front of it that gave the door enough clearance to be able to open. And so basically there was a railing around a pit, and that was where the door was. The proper way to get to this door was to literally climb over that railing and jump down into this pit, and then you'd need a key to open the door because it was always locked. Well, it was supposed to always be locked. And so when Wade saw this clearly off-limits door on the side of Owen Hall, in his drunken state, he decided it would be a good idea to try to go into it, because in his mind, he thought, you know, whatever is behind the store doesn't really matter. As long as I can just get inside of some part of Owen Hall, I can find my way up to my friend's room and I can get my jacket. And so he rushes over to the railing, he climbs over, he leaps down into that pit area, he grabs the doorknob of this off-limits door and he pulls on it, and it's open. 
So he opens it up, he steps inside, and it's totally pitch black. And all he can hear is the sound of machines humming and whirring in the darkness. And again, in his drunken state, he decides this is still a good idea. His only concern was he couldn't find a light switch, and it really was basically pitch black in here. And he was worried once the door shut, not only would his only light source be totally cut off, but it might actually lock behind him and then he'd be trapped inside of this room. And so he took off one of his shoes and he tucked it in the door jam of the door he came in on to keep it open. And so with the door propped open behind him, he began walking into this room. And pretty much right away, he bumped into this big metal structure. He couldn't see what it was because again, it was too dark, but he could feel it and he could tell, you know, it was a flat metal structure. It felt like a machine of some kind and he could hear that it was one of the machines that was buzzing and whirring. And so he just decided he would try to walk around it. Because again, his goal is just to get through this room and find another door somewhere and kind of continue his journey up into the dorm. And so Wade began moving his way left along this machine, kind of believing it was going to come to a stop at some point, and then he could walk around it. But it would turn out this machine was very big, very wide. And so by the time he actually got to the left edge of this machine, he was practically right up against the wall of the room he was in. And when he got there, he realized the space between the side of the machine and the wall of the room was big enough that if he turned sideways, he could basically squeeze his way past it. Now, he had no idea how far into the room this strange machine went, but in his drunken state, he decided it was a good idea. And so he turns sideways, so his back is to the wall of the room, and his chest is going to be facing the machine, and he begins pushing himself into that narrow space. And so as he's making his way, his hands are up, kind of protecting his face and neck, and at some point, he kind of begins to trip. Now, he didn't actually fall because he's basically wedged into this tight space. But for a second, he reflexively grabbed with his hands onto this machine right in front of him. And just by chance, his left ring finger slipped into a very narrow hole that was about two inches deep. The room that Wade was inside of was called an electrical vault, and it contained six large transformers, one of which Wade's finger had just stuck inside of. The job of these six transformers is to take the high voltage they receive from the main power grid and then transform it, hence the name, into lower usable voltage that gets dispersed into Owen Hall for residents and teachers. Even though the outside of these transformers had mostly been covered with protective materials that mitigated the electrocution risk, there were still several parts of these machines that there was just nothing you could do. They just presented a really high electrocution risk. And one of those sections you needed to be extra careful with was that two-inch hole that Wade's finger slipped inside of. At the back of that hole was an exposed electrical conductor, and the second the tip of his finger touched that conductor, between 2,000 and 4,000 volts of electricity were pumped into his body. For reference, when people get executed via the electric chair, they are electrocuted with 2,000 volts of electricity. Wade likely died instantly, but because of the fact that he was kind of wedged between the transformer and the wall, after he died, he didn't just slump onto the ground. Instead, he remained in a semi-upright position with his finger still stuck inside of that hole. And so for the next two months, his body just continued to be electrocuted every second. Finally, sometime in March, as a result of Wade's body fluids draining out of him, the electrical current that was being pumped into him altered its course and began snapping outside of his skin into the ground. And so the sound of the electrical current actually striking the ground was that popping sound that the maintenance worker heard. The door that the maintenance worker opened in order to investigate the sound was the only other door that led into the electrical vault, the other being the exterior door that Wade had gone in on. Initially, when the worker opened that door and looked inside of the vault, he actually didn't see Wade, but he smelled something funny, and that was what led him to walk into the room and make his way around, and that's when he spotted Wade's body. Earlier, on January 20th, when they found Wade's shoe, 
which at some point had just slipped out of the door jamb. So it was not propping open the exterior door when it was found. It was just sitting in that pit area and the exterior door was shut. And so when they found that shoe, the police, they did go inside of the electrical vault, but they didn't go in through the exterior door. They went around and went in the same door that the maintenance worker opened from right across the hall from the laundry room. And when they opened it up, they just looked into the room. They didn't walk into the room. They just looked from the doorway. And from their perspective, they couldn't see Wade. And so that was why initially they had said, you know, Wade is not inside of that room. Ultimately, because that exterior door to the electrical vault was supposed to be locked at all times, and clearly it was not because that's how Wade got in, Purdue was found to be negligent, and so they agreed to pay Wade's family $500,000, and they also set up a scholarship in Wade's name. Thank you for listening to the Mr. Ballin podcast. If you got something out of this episode and you haven't done this already, the next time the five-star review button has an itch on their back, offer to scratch it for them, but continuously misunderstand their directions so you never actually itch the right spot. Also, please subscribe to the Mr. Ballin podcast on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon, Google, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. This podcast airs every Monday and Thursday morning, but in the meantime, you can always watch one of the hundreds of stories we have posted on our main YouTube channel, which is just called Mr. Ballin. We now have a registered 501c3 charitable organization called the Mr. Ballin Foundation that makes it as easy as possible for you to join me, my family, and my team in supporting those whose lives have been most impacted by violent and heinous crimes. Monthly donors to the Mr. Ballin Foundation Honor Them Society will receive free gifts and exclusive invites to special live events. But the real reward is helping to create a new ending to the story for victims of violent crime. Go to mrballin.foundation and click Get Involved to join the Honor Them Society today. If you want to get in touch with me, please follow me on any major social media platform and then send me a direct message. My username is just at Mr. Ballin, and I really do read the majority of my DMs. Lastly, we have some really cool merchandise, so head on over to shopmrballin.com to have a look. So that's going to do it. I really appreciate your support. Until next time, 